Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Wilson. Welcome to The Point. You know, David, the problem with that uh, intro, it's gotten so snazzy and so so cool that I'm afraid like I'm going to be a bitter disappointment once the music stops and they have to listen to me talk. But uh, today we've got a great webinar. We've got great guests. Uh, and the topic, of course, is claim adv advocacy, what it is and what it is not. A lot of questions surrounding it. There's been a lot of talk about claim advocacy the last uh, 10 or 12 years in the industry. So today we really wanted to try and put some definition to it, give people an idea of um, what it is and what it is not. And to do that, we're going to proceed and introduce my uh, my friend and co-host co on The Point, uh, David Langham, Judge David Langham, uh, <laughs> Deputy Chief Judge of the Florida Offices of Ju Office of Judges of Compensation Claims. Is that close, David? Did I even? I've only been doing that for three or four years, and I, I, it's you know it's a hit and miss up proposition for me. Right, right on the head, Bob. Uh, all right, right David. Well, thanks for uh, good to see you today. And why don't you start introduce our guests, and we'll get underway. It just occurred to me as you were as you were doing that. You know, I need an in introduction, but Bob Wilson needs no introduction. So <laughs> I said, uh, there we Wilson. go. I'm Bob Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> We're really lucky today uh, to have with us, first of all, uh, Lisa Thompson, uh, who spent uh, decades in the workers' compensation uh, uh, sort of hands-on business at uh, Macy's, and she's currently involved in a uh, coaching and consulting business. Uh, and the thing I find most striking about her sort of biography and background, Bob, is that she, uh, she talks about coaching people through all of life's transitions. And uh, I think that really has an applicability to this workers' comp process and system uh, because these injuries can have a real interruption and, and effect on people's lives. And I never thought about it as a life transition uh, before. And so I think she really fits into uh, this discussion we're going to have. She's got a great Vita and uh, background, uh, and she hails uh, from Cincinnati, Ohio, with us today. Uh, our other guest is Paul Signolfi that probably everybody knows. Paul's the former board uh, uh, chair in Maine, uh, and he's been uh, with Amitros for, I believe, about five or six years uh, after leaving that post. And he's, I think, very well known. You talk about not needing entry, any introduction. Uh, you just see Paul around the country at conference after conference. Uh, and the thing that, uh, that I think Paul brings to the table, uh, from my perspective at least, as, as my experience with him, is that he's got a persistent uh, sort of broad world view uh, on the way workers' compensation not only is today, but uh, he's one of the few folks that can tell you how it was. And so uh, things that are changing and things that are different. Not, not because he was there for all of it, but just, you know, but I want to clarify that. No, I, 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 never, I never bought the whole thing about him being uh, in league with Hammurabi when the code was written. Um, I'm not saying it's not true. I'm just saying I don't buy it. Um, but anyhow, I think I think the way for us to start today, and uh, if I could just turn to you first, Alicia, and, and ask you, I, I just don't know what it means. What is this claims advocacy? To me, it sounds like uh, too often, it sounds like a, a people trying to put a, a new fresh label on the same old, same old, uh, a sales pitch. And I don't think that's what it is. So what is it? What does it mean and why is it important to us? I think it's vitally important and I appreciate the question because I believe that um, there are many people in leadership based on my 22 year experience in workers comp is where I'm going to be speaking from today. So <laughs> let me just start with that. But I do believe that there are a lot of people in leadership who have gotten caught up in routine um, claims handling versus thinking outside of the box. And so I look at claims advocacy as looking at the injured or ill employee as a human first who has rights and who should be treated with dignity and coming from a core values-based leadership model, which we'll talk about later. And, and Paul, from, from your perspective, is that is, is this something new and different, or are we just putting a, a new label on something that has been around forever? I don't know. I, I think there's an element of newness to it, but if you dig back into our history, and I was not there at the very beginning, but if you dig back to our history, uh, what, is new, what is old is new again. Uh, the original uh, workers' compensation systems were designed to be very user-friendly, 
They were designed to give prompt and positive and appropriate interactions with injured workers. And if you look at the designs of how the states put them together, they were very unbureaucratic. There was no litigation anticipated. It, it, the, the idea was that people would get injured at work and they would have essentially a guaranteed flow of income and they would have a guarantee that their medical bills would be paid and there would be no friction as we know it today. So I think, I think putting different phraseology to it is new, but I think some of the ideas are things that have been around for a long time. And, and I think economic change has prompted the systems that we're most familiar with, the contentiousness. And I can tell you about that later. Well, well Paul, you, you talked about different phrase, phraseology. Um, and there are other terms that are used in conjunction with or to describe claims advocacy. There's, we talk about social determinants, deter, rented lips. We talk about social determinants of health. Uh, we talk about um, uh, workers' recovery, which is a phrase we use quite heavily at workcompcollege.com. Uh, there are biopsychosocial elements. Are these all the same thing? Are we talking about the same thing? Are there's a different? Is there a difference? A lot of people picked up on claim advocacy early on, and I, I sometimes feel like it was for lack of a better phrase to describe what we're really talking about. Um, I think the... Uh, uh, because some people have misunderstood claims advocacy because they're not really sure what they're advocating for. So are these all the same uh, description of the same type of movement? I'll go to Paul first, if I could. No, I, Bob, I, I don't think so. I think that I think there is a change. And I think um, broadly, I would describe it as a cultural change. It's a different approach to dealing with people who are injured in the workplace and how we deal with those people who are injured. So I think language is important. Uh, I think uh, communicating with people in a, in a way that is more courteous, uh, is more open, um, and is more, uh, uh, I think, friendly is, is probably a good way to put it. Uh, but I think that, the, that those were some of the original intentions of workers' compensation, though. It was yeah. not supposed to be contentious. It was not supposed to be uh, a fight about everything. So, yeah, there's some, there is a change here. But I don't think it's uh, I think it's deviating. I don't think it's deviating far from the origins of workers' compensation. OK, all right. Leisha, would you agree or disagree? And you can f feel free to disagree with Paul. I think it's, you know, <laughs> we, we encourage angst and, and fights, you know, open open arguments here on the point. You know. So so that may happen later. But right now <laughs> I oh, am going to play nice right now. OK, all right. <laughs> no, I am in agreement that. Um, this is a, a movement that I believe we need to wrap our heads around. I, um, I'll say at the beginning of the pandemic, I tiptoed around um, voicing my opinion and stating that I believe the workers' comp industry to be antiquated because I wasn't quite sure how people would perceive that. However, having given it lots of thought through the years, I'm standing by that. <laughs> and I do believe that um, addressing claims advocacy um, is appropriate, but I want to see action, less talking about it and philosophizing sizing about it, but actually putting some oomph, some power behind those words and doing something to, to make this occur. So yes, um, I do believe also that um, it's we, there's a difference in how you speak and show respect to everyone. And sometimes that's lost in the work comp industry because of all the moving parts, the deadlines, the calculations of benefit, you know, all those things become somewhat um, in conflict from time to time. And that's okay, depending on how you articulate how we build these relationships with all stakeholders, including the injured employee. Well, I would say, you know, I have to say personally, people who know me know that I've really never learned to tiptoe uh, very well, as you might see. I'm more of a, I'm more of a cannonball in the in the deep end of the pool kind of person, I guess. But uh, a number of years ago, I write in a, for my blog. I used to do a top twenty predictions or top ten predictions and. And one year you're talking about being afraid to tell the industry it's antiquated. I actually, one of my predictions was that the workers' comp industry would discover that the internet is on the computer now and they would, 
find a way to really leverage this new technology in exciting ways. Um, clearly, I think that is true. I think the, the industry has become very process driven, very reticent to change. I will say the pandemic changed some of that. Uh, it ha it, you know, I've said previously, if you had told me, you know, in, in, in February of 20, 2020, is that when the pandemic hit, uh, that this industry would be able to turn on a dime and keep operating and absorb other people's problems at the same time of related to COVID, I, I never would have believed it. So I think it was an admirable time, probably one of our finest moments in that respect. But from an advocacy perspective, I, I would agree with you um, in terms of we talk about it, but like we go to conferences and some of us talk to each other about it. And then we go back to our offices and everybody does what they've always done. So we're, we're really talking about changing a culture. And, and I will point out for the audience, um, Paul is a dean and faculty member of WorkComp College. Alicia, Alicia has been, I keep wanting to say Alicia, and I apologize if I do that. That's okay. Alicia okay. Has, has, um, is also a faculty member. And uh, I think so we've got some <laughs> like-minded folks here to begin with. So we might not get the fist fight we were hoping for, David. We'll have to think about that next time around. Um, let me, let me yeah. just encourage both of them to refer to, to my co-host as ABOB. And, and that, that maybe that that'll works. straighten him out. That works. That hey, works. Let me, hey, Bob. That's it. You know, let, me just, let me just career, ask. I, in my failed rap career, I was a Bob. But, um, <laughs> at any rate, we're, I'm going to go to the comments here shortly because we're getting some, we've got a very active group making lots of comments in the chat room, which is great. Mm -hmm. But me, I want to start off talking about what are some of the misconceptions related to claim advocacy or advocacy-based claims. Uh, I started with Paul last time. Alicia, I'm going to go back and notice I did not say Alicia. I, that that no. A-Bob is probably going to stick in my mind now, so I'll get that. Alicia, um, what are some of the misconceptions, do you think, when, when people use the phrase or look at the phrase ad, ad, claims advocacy? I think that um, a lot of people who I um, observed through the years, um, sometimes bring some things to work with them that are really happening at home. And so it's the mindset that they're bringing up to work at various times that can be in conflict with how they show up when they pick up the, the phone. And, and then during that initial conversation with an employee, maybe there's some conflict as well. And so it escalates at times, um, in my opinion, unnecessarily, because I believe that in, the, in workers' comp, we are there to help the injured employee return to some sort of um, baseline, you know, where they were before the injury. So getting into conflict um, about how that process works, how, how it, who's responsible for what, um, can we or can we not offer accommodations, all of those moving components lead to um, just some different, um, I guess, misconceptions about the purpose. And so um, I, I think I'll leave it there and uh, pass the ball. <laughs> I could talk more, but that wouldn't be fair right now. <laughs> Bob, Bob, I think oh, that will not be a problem for Paul. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. That I'm I'm, I'm I, sorry, I think Paul, a ahead. misconception, Bob, is that you can, and I think it comes with some of the newer people to the industry. I got myself into um, some trouble some months ago because I picked somebody up on the language that they were using about workers' compensation. And my comment was, you can't just simply change the language. You have to understand that this is a medically driven legal system and we have definitions. Uh, we have statutory uh, definitions of all kinds of things in workers' compensation. So you can't sort of say, I'm not gonna call people this any further, but I'm gonna call them that. Well, if you do so, and you're doing it in a pure legal context, you're, people might not know what you're talking about when you, when you have to do something with the case, if a case ever goes up on appeal. And what I'm thinking of clearly is that I had a case that went all the way to our state Supreme Court on the issue of the definition of employee. Who is an employee? Um, and it was a matter of sort of having the court ultimately determine who was correct on the, on the, the definition. So you can change, you can call it, you know, worker recovery, but you gotta be, you gotta understand that that concept is not recognized in any state statute that I'm aware of on workers' compensation. So if you wanna, if you wanna adopt that language, 
I think the best way to do it is statutorily. Change well, we, we would like to do that. We're open to suggestions, Paul. So anytime we will we'll talk to you after after the show about how to how to go about that. Um, I so, think that's so a good me, point. Let me jump in. Go sorry. ahead, please, please. I, so I agree with what Paul's saying, but it, it, it seems simple to me and maybe it's not. But <clears throat> yes, we we're for now, I think maybe one of the first steps is to consider the language that we utilize when we're communicating with the people that matter versus changing historically from a legal perspective. Not that I, I think that could happen and should probably be addressed, but I don't see it as the priority. Um, I think when we're using those other words that you alluded to with the injured employee or their supervisor and their manager, I think therein lies some areas of opportunity to change the words and the approach. Yeah, I would agree. You kind of said basically what I was going to allude to. I think uh, you because know, Paul, your your statement. I mean, when I heard your statement, I heard an attorney talking, and I know that's what you are by trade. And in the legal world, you're absolutely correct. But we we have a two sided coin in our industry. We have the legal world where we have to deal with all of the machinations and the regulations. But then we have the people we're dealing with who are not in that legal world. They are just injured, and they don't necessarily understand. You know, and it, it I, you kind of hit a hot button because, I mean, and there's a comment. Um, uh, I think Elena has made a comment that it should be maybe we should consider recovery advocacy versus claims advocacy yeah. because it it sets a better tone. And now obviously, everyone knows I'm a big fan of the word recovery, uh, but I think that that the people that we're dealing with don't understand the system they don't understand you know and and imagine if you don't know anything about the system and you're assigned a claims examiner who's going to investigate your claim all you know is you fell down some steps and you broke your shoulder you know you hurt yourself but someone's going to investigate your claim yes it needs to be investigated but there are different ways when communicating with the non-legal element that side of our coin and workers comp to not have to use those statutorily defined terms. I, I mean, would you agree with that, Paul? I would agree. I think I, I think a key to this whole new paradigm is to speak English when you're talking with the people that are in the system and do away with the acronyms as much as you can. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm troubled by uh, some of the conversation that I have with people where they don't, they don't they speak in acronyms and i've been in the industry for a long time and i have no idea sometimes what they're talking about oh i thought it was just me i've, no, I've been nodding my head like i understood for 20 some years uh -huh. Uh -huh. yeah um, but i think that's right but i have to tell you having represented over the course of my career so my practice was one where i represented injured workers part of the time and i did defense work part of the time uh, depending on the, 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 ge the geography of my state, I, I handled uh, claimant cases in one part of the state and I did defense in the other part of the state. Uh, but my injured clients were primarily concerned about getting timely and appropriate payments. And frankly, many of them could care less what you call them as long as you paid them on time and you covered all their medical bills. Um, so I don't know, I don't know what other people think about that, but that. That's, that's my take on some of the language. I'm going to hand off to David at this point. He's been listening patiently. Uh, uh, I think he may have another question to throw into the mix or a comment. David. Well, the thing that occurs to me, Bob, from this last bit of exchange, uh, we're talking about words, and we put this label out there, this claims advocacy or recovery advocacy, whatever label you want to hang on it, I want to hear more from, from Leisha. Is, is this a, a distinction between talking the talk and actually walking the walk? Is that is that where we're having a problem? Are we too focused on the labels? For sure. So when this will take leadership, right? Leadership who is empowered because of what's within, not because of the title, because leadership is a state of mind. So we're seeking leaders who are unafraid to, to challenge the status quo. So that, that's heavy for some people to go against the way it's always been. But I believe that we are blessed to have survived the pandemic. Um, 
you know, uh, the racial awakening, <laughs> police brutality, um, war in Ukraine. I mean, all these huge life changing situations have occurred that we've survived. So surely we can step up as leaders in an industry to re reshape how it's not only perceived, but day to day. So those of us who work in the industry made a choice, a choice to be a part of the industry. I love the industry, but I've always known there's room for improvement because there's room for improvement in every aspect of life. So again, I am not about talking about it anymore. <laughs> um, I, I do feel strongly about need for improvement, particularly having seen and witnessed everything in the past two years. Um, I, I want to empower leaders to lead by action um, and by the mere fact that you chose to be in an industry and that means making changes where changes are necessary. And, and that, that leads me right back to what you were saying, Paul, about maybe this isn't a new idea. Is this about leading us back to our roots? And, and maybe that's not the right phraseology, but I, I agree with your point. I, I think that this is how comp was supposed to be. It was supposed to be administrative. It was supposed to avoid litigation. It was supposed to be rapid. Is that what we're really talking about? Just getting back to where we were? I think of conversations that I've had with people who've been in the industry for a long time. When I first started doing defense work, I got a great deal of cases from Liberty Mutual Insurance Company. And there was an adjuster in Northern New England for Liberty who had an incredible number of cases, but he told me in the old days, so that would have been like 10 or 15 years before he and I were first talking. So that, so that would have been- In the thirties, we're with you in the thirties. <laughs> <laughs> something oh. like that, David, something like that. But anyway, he would talk about hand delivering checks to injured yeah. workers. Yeah. He, would, he would visit with Tom Glasson from AIG. Yeah tells yeah. very similar stories about actually going and visiting with people and hand delivering their first workers' compensation check and introducing himself. Hi, I'm going to be managing your case. I'm going to be handling your case. Let me let me throw some numbers out. And, and th this is my sense of why we got away from our roots. Um, and I can talk about the state of Maine with some specific, specificity. In, 60, in 1964, there was $3 million paid out in claims. In 1974, it was $14 million. Then we have the Grand uh, Commission. We have the National Commission in 72. We adopted many of the recommendations. In 1979, it was $55 million. And in 1984, it was $128 million. So over a 20 year period, the this amount that was pa paid out in benefits and what was going on in workers' compensation increased by 43 times. Uh, the, this the this was in Maine? This was in my little state, yeah. Uh, and so I think part of what, what happened is that the industry, and I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be a, a, a defender of the industry other than to say the industry got overwhelmed over a short period of time and they tried to deal with the over, being overwhelmed by setting up these systems where they, they became far less personal than they were intended to be originally. That's my theory. I'm well, sticking to it. <laughs> was it was it overwhelmed or was it also a perceived in this environment cost cutting measure where you have consolidation and, and the same story. Tom Glass and I've heard him talk about stroking a check on the hood of a car, settling yep. a claim. Yep. He also has a very compelling story about being in an injured worker's house and realizing the, the, the I, I believe it was the wife of the injured worker had only orange juice in her refrigerator. She had no food for her kids and didn't know where the next check was coming from. That's impactful. And in the consolidation and the move to cubicles and all these specialty firms that are out there doing a lot of things old adjusters used to do, old, old style adjusters used to do, have we lost that contact? In other words, have we commoditized the injured worker to the point where they've become a faceless file? And I, I think that's a, a concern and what we're, a lot of us who have been talking about this topic, and again, talking, not necessarily changing anything, Leisha, but we've been talking, um, 
are we trying to get back to that point where we can not, once again put a face and a human life to 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 that name? I, I speak at conferences and I quite often will ask the audience for claims adjusters. You know, when you get a new file on your desk, what's the overriding goal for that file? And inevitably, inevitably, they all say close it. Someone says close it. One time in Idaho, a woman said, treat them properly, get them proper care, and get them back to work. And everyone in the room looked like her like she was looked at her like she was on drugs. Um, but we talk about closing the claim, and that's success, okay, for the file. But is it success for the injured worker? What happens after that file's closed? And I think we're trying to incorporate a greater picture, if I could, into understanding what our actions, what our, our processes do, and how we can actually leave and improve someone's life, I think. Um, at least in my mind, that's kind of where we're heading. And I think that some of it happened... Maybe to your point, trying to keep up to a, a rapidly expanding area of responsibility, but at the same time looking to control costs and make things as efficient as possible. And and we, and I think, you know, commoditizing the injured worker may be the outcome of that. Yeah. Um, so that God. so that leads. Sorry, yep. go ahead. No, please go ahead. You're our <laughs> guest. You can interrupt us <laughs> anytime you want. <laughs> I was going to say that leads to the. One of the big reasons why I love um, the initiative of Work Comp College, because we're talking about whole person recovery. Right. And so when we think of that, um, there are some opportunities. Yes, we have to control costs, the cost of medical care, cost of pharmaceuticals. We know all of that is exorbitant. So, yes, we have to control that. But in doing so, there's still huge opportunity to at least make it clear to the employee and then also to the manager the team that this person reports to because there are, excuse me there are often breakdowns because breakdowns in communication because there are so many moving components to one individual claim and that injured worker is having to speak to so many different people who aren't necessarily privy to see what the person before said or where these handoffs are occurring so it, it, it leads to a lot of frustration for everyone, not just the injured employee, but also for, you know, it's HR, it's leave of absence, it's um, whomever. And then if you are working with a third party administrator, you got all these pieces, all payroll. I mean, I could go on for days. So so in when we envision the future um, and, and where these opportunities exist, technology um, is a I like technology. It frightens others. <laughs> but I think that as we reimagine the future, that's an area to to really focus on um, systems where everyone can see what the other where it is, like where everything is so that we're not misspeaking or saying things to even further confuse the employee who has a family, to your point, who has children, who who relies on their income to pay bills. I mean, that's that's just real life. And in, well, and in I, fairness, I, it's not just the employee, it's the employer. Yeah. And, right. and not so much at Macy's. OK, but the well, small there too. <laughs> the, no, but the small employer out there that doesn't have an HR manager, the, right. the mm -hmm. small employer that's got 15 or 20 employees and has got an injury my experience is that those people don't understand what's going on when someone gets hurt. They don't, they're not getting the big picture and they don't know how to help. And as a result of that, I think oftentimes they hinder the recovery process. Oh, is that, well, am I missing the boat? No, I think, I think you're right on point judge. I, mm -hmm. I can remember having cases where I would appear before a judge who would want to scold me and my client for not having timely filed something. And I can remember one time saying to one of the judges, Your Honor, you just don't understand. This, this man has never had a workers' compensation claim against him before. He has 10 employees. He has no idea what workers' compensation is beyond the fact that he is uh, paying premiums and has been paying premiums on an annual basis for years. You know, bear, bear with us here. He's learning this process. He's learning this system. And part of the reason why he didn't file things in a timely fashion is he simply didn't know. He didn't even know enough. To, in that particular case, he didn't even know enough uh, about his responsibility to contact the carrier and let the carrier know what was going on. So many things were done late in large part because of, of ignorance. 
I think we've talked about that before at these conferences where we all go and essentially talk to ourselves. You know, it's the same people showing up at conferences. <laughs> we we talk about how to do these things. Yet half the tr ha at half the claims in this country, half the people in this country work for small employers yeah. who who quite honestly their only awareness of workers' comp is it's a pain in the ass mandated, excuse my language, mandated expense. They have to buy it, except in Texas, perhaps. Um, I don't know why my camera keeps zooming in and out. It's for a fact, really. It's, it's, uh, anyway, um, but I think that we have a terrible time reaching those people. I would love to see more engaged involvement of agents and brokers who are the people who deal with these employees to help at least provide some level of education. Unfortunately, I've got to be honest, I piss off some people when I say this. The agents are largely non-existent in a lot of these forums. We don't see them a lot active. Uh, in the conferences, there are some. There obviously there are some. There are some exceptions, but they generally. My experience early on uh, with agents and workers comp as a business, as a small business person, I had one agent who's a friend of mine tell me he doesn't want to sell comp to anybody who has less than ten employees because we're we're a pain in the butt. We don't have an HR department. He becomes the de facto HR, and he says yeah. I'm not going to do all that for four dollars a month in commission. Yeah. And so we have a problem reaching because these employers can torpedo that claim before the carrier even knows there's a claim if they don't know what they're doing. That's true. And that's, that's probably we just came up with the topic for our next webinar, David, because it's way off course for where we are here. But that's that's something we need to understand in that process when we're dealing with people. I don't I don't think we're off course. With all due respect, I think we're on course because we're talking about advocacy. And, and if you take. I've known a lot of employers in, in my experience that will advocate for the worker if they knew how and yeah. and they want to cooperate and they, they want to help. And I think if we're not engaging everybody on the team in the in the activity we're up to, I think we're hobbling ourselves. And so I think advocacy from the way I perceive it has to involve the whole team. We need the examiner, adjuster, whatever you want to call him or her. We need the, the doctor. We need the employer. We need the injured worker on board with understanding what's going on and why what's happening is happening. And that, to me, is where we've gotten off the rails. How, yeah. how do we get back on the rails? How do we build that? Um, I know I like the word community, but to me it is. It's a community of effort. How do we get that back on track? Uh, Alicia, any thought? I think it starts with the mindset, Who's? meaning uh, everyone, all the <laughs> stakeholders. <laughs> um, and, and it can sound and feel overwhelming because there are so many moving components. So um, starting with the C-suite is where I, I want to, um, I guess, would focus there because that's where change can really be seen and shown. And people tend to look um, some people tend to think that if it's not coming from the C-suite or from a higher level, that it doesn't need to be addressed. And so I would like to see the C-suite addressing some of these or encouraging or empowering, wh whatever word you want to use to say that it's recognized that there are some opportunities here and then allowing or providing um, training if necessary to the leaders so that it can trickle down. I don't think it's gonna happen from the front line going in reverse. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Judge, if I were to answer your question, I, I would say that uh, when I was an executive director, a position that I held for eight years, I spent a lot of time educating the business community. Invite me to speak business community and I will be there. Uh, I, I, that required some presentations at some picnics on Saturdays where companies were having things, or I went to uh, you know, different, different uh, uh, trade associations within our state. But I think um, it's a matter of educating the, um, the business community, uh, the employers, that this is what workers' compensation is. And if you have problems, these are people that you can contact and speak with uh, uh, about how to solve your problem. Uh, and these are people with some knowledge about how to do things. So I think it's a matter of educating l literally everybody uh, in the, in the uh, workers' compensation community, the employers and the employees. I, I would agree with that. You know, we talk a lot at WorkComp College, we were talking a lot about improving outcomes for injured workers. 
one of the things we haven't really touched on or we don't really talk about it, and, and the, it's a dirty little secret, I suppose, is that if we can improve outcomes for injured workers, we're actually also improving outcomes for their employers because okay. we're getting them back to work we're, or we're reducing the indemnity costs, we're reducing the medical expenses, any of those types of things. So, so from that point, and I probably just tip my hand on this question, does this process we're talking about just work for one party? Or are we talking about a big picture, whole solution that advocates for all the people we're supposed to represent? I'll just throw that out. Anyone can answer it or, or not. But uh, Big picture, for sure. Um, the, you know, the claims handlers do feel pressure. Um, many feel that they cannot physically nor mentally keep up with all the requirements. And so, it, and it's, it's true, there are some challenges with what's the right caseload, what type of training are we offering, what type of technology is available depending on the size of the organization. There's, there's a lot that would need to be taken into consideration. And I see that someone, um, Phyllis mentioned small employers that don't even have a C-suite, so good yeah. point. <laughs> so, and sometimes don't, I Don't encourage about, Phyllis, by the way. I, I know him. You don't want to encourage I, her. I just no, saw her comment. Absolutely right. I saw that comment. Right. I, I just wanted to acknowledge it because, you know, I, I came from a large corporation. So yeah. honestly, yeah. Um, I, I, I guess I do speak from that vantage point um, rather than from a smaller employer, a whole different set of concerns. I, I get it. I get it. <laughs> I have been corrected from down under. Uh, Rosemary from Australia tells me it is not a big picture. It's the whole picture. <laughs> now, I'll 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 That's I'll see right. that point and stand corrected. Alicia, we do have a, and I can't keep up. the The chat room has been extremely active. I don't even want to interrupt them and let them know there's a webinar going on because they're very busy <laughs> talking amongst themselves. They're having their own conversation. They love are. It. <laughs> they are, which is great. Which is great. But there is yes. a question uh, directed actually for you, Alicia, from Dawn. Okay. Uh, Alicia, thank you for reminding us. Claims professionals bring their own psychosocial selves to the employee's injury experience. What recommendations do you have to help us mitigate the impact of our day-to-day -day challenge, challenges on the employee employee's experience with us? Ooh. So, to try oh, to keep- Take a our, second to think it over. Oh, yeah. Try to keep it short. <laughs> that's a big one. I know, that's like, like, here's a large question to drop on your desk. So, so I love when, um, the leaders, the the managers, the whomever, vice presidents, I love when they really get to know, when we get to know who reports to us as a person. Um, I think that's necessary because in, in having open uh, dialogue, and I'm not saying talk about everything personal at work, bring your home life to work. I'm not saying that, but you can see when someone is coming to work and they appear to be troubled, shaken, or their performance changes. So that's an opportunity to show that you, you value this person that reports or who's on your team. And in doing that, often you find out what really is going on. So, so what do you do then? We don't have to get all into their personal life, but there are opportunities to suggest resources. Um, is that the... the um, the I'm drawing a blank right now, you guys. Uh, the program. Um, okay, you're doing um, great. Considering we put you on the spot, bro. I can't think of the the acronym for the program. But if you if you need resources such as counseling, therapy, wh whatever, um, those are opportunities that a lot of thank e you, yeah. thank you. <laughs> But yes, that, that's sometimes I think a miss um, when you're in your head about things going on and then you come to work and you're trying to show up your best self in all aspects. Sometimes we're not necessarily remembering that there are resources available through the benefits program. And so um, I'm also maybe you already know, an advocate for coaching, leadership development um, and mindset coaching, I think. Is there's a huge opportunity in the work comp industry to help people see where blind spots are. Sometimes we come to work with the best intent, but because we're trying to file all the forms, calculate the benefits, um, deal with the pharmacy who is or isn't filling the scripts that should be, or we're trying to talk to the 
prescribing physician to titrate the meds down, but we have to litigate. I mean, all that's going on on, on one claim, perhaps. So, so it can be extremely overwhelming. So, so therein lies opportunity for coaching. I would love to see employers of all sizes embrace the fact that there are um, people who, who who can work with groups, even not individuals, but groups um, that could come on site, do it remotely, whatever that looks like, but to address mindset opportunities to increase and to also expose blind spots that we have sometimes, even with the best um, intent. Sometimes we're just blinded by our own thoughts um, you know, thinking this is what this employee wants. I'm not giving it to them. But we don't, that that may not be factual at all if a different conversation were to take place. And I know there are time restraints for these conversations. So there is a lot, um, but if we offer options to the employees, they have a choice. They they can say that that's applicable or, or that's not what the issue is. What what is going on? What 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 would help you to increase performance and in, in communication, um, soft skills, all those um, aspects? I think um, just lend their themselves to opportunities for improvement. And I hope that as leaders we know and we admit there are always opportunities for improvement will yeah. never reach the, the highest level. We leaders are to grow. That's my opinion. I, I think Leisha's onto something. You know, a, a population in this community, to use Judge Langham's comments, a population within this community that really doesn't get a lot of respect and has really di a difficult jobs in many instances because they have all kinds of pressures on them are the adjusters. Um, yeah. You know, there's expectations on them. They have to file the paperwork properly. Have to pay in a timely fashion. They have to do this, and they're dealing with they're dealing with cases. And oh, look at here! With here's three or four new cases that just came in. So I I think keeping those those folks uh, up to speed on the changes in the law uh, and the proper ways of dealing with injured workers is uh, is a real chore. Well, you've really hit on something. I had a friend now many years ago. We were talking about some. I can't even remember the conversation. Someone had been promoted and she said, I don't know what they, why they would use that person. He's just a claims guy. That's all. That's what she said. She, this was an attorney by trade, by the way, just a claims guy. And I asked another friend of mine who's well known in the industry, long time claim experience. What does that mean? Cause I'd heard that before. I'd heard people say just a claims guy. And he said, well, claims generally in some companies, is treated as the redheaded stepchild. They're viewed as an expense line. They're an expense. They don't produce any revenue. So they're not given the respect or the treatment or the training that they really should have. And I thought that is absolute insanity. That's the stupidest thing I'd ever heard. Well, I've heard lots of stupid things. I've said some too, but that was really stupid because to me, the claims relationship is the most critical point of the, of the process, the most critical point in the relationship at the most critical time when someone's hurt and assets are at risk. So Bob, really, one, yeah. one of the best adjusters that I ever dealt with was a guy who was a badly injured worker himself who went through a vocational rehabilitation program. And as a result of that vocational rehabilitation program, they made him an adjuster. And he was terrific because he had been there. He understood it. He had, he had crawled out of the trenches and got himself into an adjusting position. And the other thing about him is that he was somewhat fearless. He, he would agree to do things that he probably shouldn't agree to do, uh, put on educational programs and things like that. That's part of that's part of how I started developing a close relationship with him. Yeah. But think about that. Here's a guy who understands what it's like. And he had all the all the key communication uh, issues completely under control. Well, we would love, you know, we would love to see young people come into the industry. I know at WorkComp College, we've got a scholarship program. Um, you know, I, lot Mark, uh, Mark, who's Mark? Never mind. Paul, you're involved in Kids Chance of Maine. Um, been involved in Kids Chance. I'm heavily involved in Kids Chance. If you've met a lot of these kids around the country, they're strong. They've already been through. They've already learned that bad things can happen to good people. Uh, you know, hear about some of the stories that go on in colleges these days and, and, and the free speech zones and the crying closets and things like that. These are not those kids. 
they already know that life cannot be may not be fair. But they've also a lot of them have chosen professions that are somehow related to what their parents went through in a traumatic injury in a, in a debilitating injury. And um, we'd like to see some of those kids come back into workers' comp yes. and be able to help manage claims and help people uh, to either help like their parents were helped or to avoid any problems their parents might have had. There, you know, and I'll just put this out for the audience if you know any, if you're involved in Kids Chance, uh, workcompcollege.com. If any Kids Chance scholarship recipient anywhere in the country, if they've had a scholarship from Kids Chance, they've got an automatic uh, scholarship into Work Comp College. We, we'll, we'll put their way because we want to s- encourage kids to okay. stay in the insurance world, to stay in workers' comp and come yeah. back in. And these kids are tough. They're really, they're good people and they're, they'd be compassionate in, in this type of environment. So that said, um, I do have to comment. We mentioned Phyllis earlier. I was joking. Phyllis left an earlier comment that her, her iPad Pro is still working strongly, which is great. Uh, I sent her that iPad. She was the six millionth reader of my blog. Uh, she hit the six million mark and won an iPad Pro. Of course, I think she she, she had to file a claim because she had to refresh the page 4,278,000 times to get to that spot. But, you know, good for her for sticking it out. Um, at any rate, David, I'll go back to you now. I'm now I'm off topic. So just a can, little can bit. Can we talk about collaboration? <laughs> well, that, Only if we all agree on it. Yeah. No, that's that's exactly where I was coming back to because of the comments that I've noticed, Leisha, in the in the mm-hmm. chat, uh, the we don't have a C suite or uh, the adjusters are siloed is, is something I think that, that Bob's getting at. How do we have a how do we have a conversation that is, if not global, closer to global than we are right now? How do we how do we talk in a way that we can approach a, a broad spectrum of, of people and try to get a message out that is uh, impactful? What are we what are we missing? Coach us. Coaches, but also just um, team building coming together, uh, it, you know, there's benefit, for example, having <clears throat> the claims teams sitting at the same table with some of the people in uh, leave of absence and or HR. I mean, just cross channel, if that's what it would be called. <laughs> Collaboration exposes and educates why there why there's a necessity of um, partnerships along those lines. And I think we work in silos often. And so we may assume or someone may assume because this is how it's done on the claim side, they, they, they don't truly understand what's happening when that person, that employee then applies for a leave of absence, for example. What's the paperwork requirement? It, and it's different from what it is for claims. And so there's opportunity just for cross-functional um, educational opportunities. And even what if you want to transfer and move over into a different team? What if you feel as though you've gained a lot of knowledge, but you're curious about how how it ha- what happens when when that person then moves over to someone in a different group? I think there's respect that can be gained by just learning more about the entire claims processes. Paul, uh, I would agree. How would you lead us? <laughs> no, I think the the idea of collaboration just makes good sense. I think. And, and uh, I think Alicia is absolutely correct. Some type of uh, educational forum for this to, to get to get the different stakeholders together to try to figure out what they're what they're all looking at and and how they can possibly deal with it. I'm with her on that. Alicia, we're together on this one. <laughs> okay, sounds great. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I I would feel better if we had some if we had some steps to move forward from today. I, I mean, if, if we could give to the audience, Paul, what are, what are three things that uh, everybody listening today could do over the next 30 days that would move us forward? Uh, one, uh, a comment that I made earlier, uh, stop using acronyms, speak English uh, when you're talking to anybody within the industry. Two, be sensitive to what other people are doing uh, in in their roles within this this broad community. Uh, this broad community, um, and w- one of the things that I want to sensitize people to. So this would be my number three: 
is that I'm genuinely concerned about this advocacy model that we're talking about, this change in culture, and what role technology will play in that, and whether technology will disrupt it or whether technology in some way will facilitate it. And what I mean by that is that if we're too heavily reliant on technology, we lose the personal communication. And if and I think we can be heavily reliant on technology and have it deal with the issues that lend themselves to technology so that we have more free time to deal with the personal issues uh, in this business. So those are my three suggestions. I have to quickly tie in because we've mentioned technology numerous times and I, I am in agreement with you, Paul. I think it's got, and, and what Alicia has referred to, it's got tremendous opportunity to improve some of the processes and help, but it's got to be accompanied by smart human thinking and smart human decisions. If you think about, uh, there was a speaker at NCCI's AIS uh, annual issue symposium last year who did a great job talking about artificial intelligence, but one of his biggest focuses was on what he, what he called artificial stupidity which was the use of AI and other technology without appropriate guardrails to yeah. make sure that the proper decisions are being made. I guarantee there's someone out there somewhere in a C-suite or something trying to figure out how to replace a claim staff with artificial intelligence. You know, and, and if you think it's an, if you think the system lacks humanity now, wait until that happens. I think you've got now AI can help drive great analysis it can drive great medical assistance but you still have to have we have to make the proper decisions around technology yeah. to make sure that we're containing it in a, in a, in a capacity that it, it is effective and and to use to its best purposes I, we have the ability to make some really stupid decisions in the next few years as it relates to technology that's yeah. that's my opinion yeah have it be some have it be uh, symbiotic as opposed to having it take over the industry Right, right, right. And, and I'd so, be curious, um, Leisha, do you have three things that you would have people listening do? <laughs> that would Sorry, I jumped the gun. I just had to. No, 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 that's OK. No, that's great. No, um, I, I just wanted to touch on um, transformative leadership, values based leadership. I don't want us to forget that we're dealing with people, lives all the way around, the employees who are injured, but then also the staffing, you know, the people who handle the claims. And so some some values based areas that I just want to toss out there would be operating in a manner of integrity personally, not forgetting that your vision for the future is valuable. So don't sit back and wish and hope that someone would, would make a suggestion when you've already visualized how it could look. I, um, I want collaboration, of course, tenacity, perseverance, all those great values that people have, but sometimes feel they can't articulate them when they get to work. And I would like to see that change so that we are encouraging people and giving them space to share their vision because we get the best ideas most often coming from the people on the front line. And those are also the people who often feel as though they're not heard. And so I just wanted to mention that because who knows best what's going on during the conversations? Yes, I can look at great technology, I can read it, but it's only as good as or as effective as the person who had the time in, when they're rushed to, to put in the message so that it, it, it can be read in the truest sense of what happened. So there are all kinds of nuances um, and areas for improvement. But I, I just wanted to say for me, I think transformative leaders operate from a values-based mindset. So I know I've mentioned mindset a few times. I just think it's super important to encourage and allow that to um, lend itself to the resolution um, of what we're talking about. Super. We that's that's super. We we've, we've got just about five minutes left. Um, we're going to come back for just final thoughts. Anything you want to add? Um, although those were excellent points right there. I, I do have a couple housekeeping things I want to mention very quickly for those attending. Uh, next week, WorkCompCollege.com is presenting its first live class. It will be presented live through this system, and then it will become a class in our what will be our advanced training and education center. It is uh, on toward an, toward an equitable system of compensation, the National Commission 
on state workmen's compensation laws. It is a great panel. Jennifer Wolf is moderating. Abby Hudgens, former Bureau Administrator of Tennessee. Judge Timothy Connor from Tennessee. Alan Pierce, an attorney from the Northeast. And Dr. John Rooser, the CEO of uh, WCRI, will all be discussing the 1972 uh, Commission's report, where we are today, um, and, and where we maybe should have gone. It's going to be a great discussion, so I encourage people to visit our site and register for that. See, that was the commercial. you got to just slip that right in. So um, that said, we've got just a couple minutes left. Uh, any final thoughts, uh, Paul, that you, you'd like to share or add? Yeah, uh, other than it's 30 degrees in New Hampshire and 82 here in Bradenton, Florida. <laughs> and it snowed yesterday. Uh, anyway, uh, he, here's my comment. Uh, in thinking about this presentation, we have to remember that workers' compensation does not exist in a vacuum. It exists in society at large. And I can tell you one of the basic discussions that I would have the first time I met with an injured worker is I would say to them, you know, the best workers' compensation claim you could have, the absolute best, is no claim at all. This claim in some way will change your life. People are going to deal with you differently. Society is going to deal with you differently. Your friends are going to deal with you differently. So, yes, let's work on this claims advocacy approach so that within the system, people are appreciated a little bit better. But be mindful that society at large needs to be educated as well because they, they have an attitude about workers' compensation that's not always positive. True, true. Yeah, every claim is not fraudulent, right? Every claim is not, that. let's not assume. <laughs> right. yeah. Great point, right. great point. Leisha, any final thoughts? Yes, um, so I've been talking a lot about values-based leadership, transformative thought processes, <laughs> um, and being intentional about creating new habits, new ideas, new concepts, and then moving, you know, taking action to move these, these thoughts forward to make them a reality. So I'm going to toot my own horn here, but I would love for you, if you haven't considered, if anyone is listening or watching, if you have not considered... Um, becoming a student uh, of work comp college, I, I really encourage you to do so, but also take my course. I'm, if you want more information about what I've spoken about today, <laughs> I go into it at a much deeper high level, <laughs> but we're all the, I just truly believe in the model with work comp college, but I also am standing strong 10 toes down and changing mindsets around um, benefits that exist by aligning your core values with clear vision, goal setting personally and professionally and reminding you if you work in the work comp industry, that's a choice. So if you choose to be a part of this, then bring your best self to the table every day all day. And if that isn't possible, utilize resources that are available to help change um, how that looks and feels for you. Well, I, and I, I think that's excellent. And I would add that it's not just a choice. It can be a noble choice if we do it right. This is an industry that can restore broken and shattered lives. We can Absolutely. restore function and use to people who have gone through tragic incidents. And that's something we need to remember. And it's the way we need to market the industry. And by the way, I love the plug. Thank you for that. We would have opened with that if I'd known. I mean, we could just start again, there you go. But, but that's good. And, you know, Paul, to your point about not being existing in a vacuum, it's a part of our tagline. It's better outcomes, better communities, better world, because they're Perfect. all connected. They really are. And that's what we're trying to do. David, you got 30 seconds. Any thought? Uh, my, my mind is a, a racing cascade of thoughts, but here's the one that I think matters. Um, you hear all the time about preaching to the choir, and I realize that probably in that chat room, uh, probably on this call, we are to a large degree preaching to the choir. I want to just say thank you to all those folks who took the time to, to tune in. I think they care about trying to make a difference and, and change something. And I would encourage us, each of us uh, watching and speaking uh, to make it our focus to just find a new member for the choir. And if we can each keep bringing in new members to the choir, I think we can win this thing. So I thank you all for being here, and I've really enjoyed today. Thank you all. Thank you. All right, super. Thank, thank you, David. You. Lisa thank Thompson, you. Paul Signoffi, thank you very much. Everybody's watching today. Thanks for joining us. Great conversation. We'll see you on the next time on The Point. Thanks for joining us today.